Hello and welcome to Numerous to Coal. We are continuing our series on the fundamentals of gradient boosting. This is the second video in the series. In the first video, we talked about decision trees and really motivated them and showed why they're a very powerful tool. And in this video, we're going to talk about random forests, how you can take a collection of decision trees, inject randomness so that the trees are different from one another, and then average the results of those trees to get a much more powerful predictive mechanism. And we'll also do some motivation and some exploration of these of these forests. And I think if, even if you know random forests, I think it'll be worthwhile to, to really go into details and see some, some nitty gritty details about how they work. So I hope you'll find it useful. Um, if you get a chance before we get into it, if you could please like the video and subscribe to the channel, that really helps me out a lot. And without further ado, let's get into the lecture. Now we're going to talk about random forests. And to begin, we're going to give a little bit of motivation for, for how this idea might have come up or why you might think that averaging a bunch of decision trees will give you good results and better results than a single decision tree. So imagine you're building a decision tree. And at that root node, you have a, a very close call between two different variables. So let's say it's age and income. So the, the best split was actually found at age 28 or lower versus 29 or higher. And that's, that gave you the best split value for the immediate greedy split. But it was also really close. If you put income 75,000 or less versus greater than 75,000, that also gave a, a, a very good split. And so first you build the tree that the decision tree algorithm told you to build, which is you choose the very best split, which was on age, and you build that tree out, and you get a tree, and we call that T1. But then, then you're curious, and you say, well, I'm also going to do that income split at the top. So I'm going to choose kind of the second best split at the top node, and then from there build out the tree normally. And I'm going to call that tree T2. And you can see how these two trees are going to be very, very different, right? Because one essentially broke people into young people and old people and then built models on those two data sets separately. And T2, its first split is about income. So it's basically going to split people into low income and high income and, then, and make two separate models on low income people, one model on low income people, one model on high income people. So you can imagine they're going to be very different perspectives. And you find that you try averaging the, the predictions of T1 and T2. So you, not the predictors, the actual predictions of T1 and T2. And uh, you find that it does better. You actually get a better model when you average the predictions of the two trees. Uh, rather than using either tree by itself. And, you know, this gives an idea, okay, wow, I did better because I sort of combined these two different perspectives. I had an age-based perspective and an income-based perspective. And by averaging the two, I got better results. Is there a way I can expand on this? And this is kind of where, you know, you could think of where, where the, the idea from for a random forest might get motivated. So, the, one of the issues with this, though, is that the decision tree algorithm itself is deterministic. So if I run the decision tree algorithm on a data set over and over and over again, I'm just going to get the same tree over and over and over. So I can't just run the decision tree algorithm, you know, 100, 500 times to see if I get something different. So we need to inject randomness somehow. And the inventors of the random forest came up with two ways to inject randomness into the process of building decision trees. The first is to randomize the training data, so to not use the exact same data set every time. And the second is adding randomization into which features you're going to inspect at each node. And we'll talk about each of these uh, right now. So first is how do you randomize the training data? Well, the key is you don't use the full original data set on every tree. Instead, you choose a random sample of the data. 
separately for each tree. So each tree has, is going to use a different random sample of the data. Now, what do I mean by a random sample? Well, classically, in the original paper, the way they've decided to do this was to choose a sample of your data with replacement that's the same size as your original data set. So if I had a thousand data points, what they would say to do is randomly pick a data point, put it on your list, and then kind of put that, replace it, put it back in the bag, and then randomly choose a data point again. So you would choose a thousand times from your data set, but you could choose the same data point more than once. And so typically if you chose a thousand samples with replacement from your data set of size a thousand, what would happen is some data points would be represented two, three, four times. Some data points would not be represented at all. And they would say, that's okay. It's okay if you're repeating a data point. Just pretend they're separate data points and, and do that. So for every tree, we'd pick a different data set with replacement and build a tree on that. And this way you'd get, not every tree is using the exact same data set, so you'd get some variation in the trees. This process is called bagging, this sampling with replacement that's the same size. This is called bagging. Now, you could also choose without replacement, and you could choose different sample sizes. So you could, you can, you could play with this. This isn't written in stone that this is the only possible way to do it. Uh, you could say, I'm going to just choose 70% of my data um, you know, without replacement. I'm going to choose a simple random sample size 700 from my, my data set of size 1,000 and build each tree on that. That also works. But in general, this process of varying the data, it, it helps, but only a little bit. What, what typically ends up happening is still whatever feature you choose at the node, you tend to always choose that, even with the slight variations in the data set. So this, this only helped a little bit at making the, the trees different from one another. So there's a second idea that says, let's randomize the features. So how do you randomize the features? Well, the idea is you're not going to check every possible feature in your training data at every node. Rather, at each node, you choose a subset of the features and only consider those. And you can see how this might be very powerful. Um, because, for example, in the previous case where we said, hey, age and income both had pretty good predictive power at the top of the tree. Sometimes you choose a subset and sometimes age would be there and income wouldn't be there and sometimes income would be there but age and age would not be there. So you would end up having some trees with age and some trees with income and maybe some trees with, with neither of those variables when you choose a subset that didn't have either of those. So you'll get different perspectives primarily at the root and then even more so as you go down the tree. And then the size of this subset of features, so what, what should the size of the subset of features be? This is what's called a hyperparameter, which is a, a, a knob, basically, in your algorithm that you say, I don't really know where to set this, but I know I don't, in this case, you're saying, I know I don't want it to be all the nodes, because then I just, I'm kind of back to the original decision tree algorithm again. Uh, and I don't want it to just be like, I pick one random feature to split on every time, because you might get features that just aren't very predictive. So you can think about this as this allows trees to use different perspectives. This idea of the age, that if you had the age split on age at the top, you'd have an age-based perspective. If you split on income at the top, you'd have an income-based perspective. This allows trees to use different perspectives, and not just at the root, but also further down in the tree. And it sort of combats this greediness of the decision tree. The, the decision tree, because it's only ever looking one step ahead, it's always going to say, well, let's start with the same split, because that's the best split from what I can see now. But by adding this randomness, you force it to, to make different splits higher up in the tree. So now, how does this random forest algorithm work now, putting, putting all these ideas together? Well, you choose a size for your forest. You decide, I'm going to have 500 trees, 1,000 trees, whatever it is. Then for each tree, you choose a random sample of your training data. Again, classically, this is to choose the same size as your original data set, but with replacement, but you could experiment with other ideas too. And then at each node, you choose a random subset of your features. And then you do the same decision tree process where you check every split of every feature that's in that subset, find the best split according to some criterion, split, and then choose those different data sets uh, 
according to uh, a split and then treat those different data sets as if they were their own problems. And again, treat each data set separately, find the best split on each side and proceed down. And you'd have the same parameters uh, that you had for the original decision tree in terms of how deep to build the tree, when to stop building and so forth. And in this way, you would build a forest of trees. And then when you want to make a prediction using a random forest, you just get all of the individual tree predictions and average them. And there's sometimes some subtleties or more clever ways you might try to average these things. People have played around with things where if I've got more uh, data in a particular leaf, then I will maybe weight that more uh, in my average. But the most common thing is just to do a very simple average across all the trees. How do I choose the hyperparameters for the random forest? So we talked about how you have to choose a number of trees. And you know, 500 or 1,000 is typically enough. Um, you can't really make things worse by having too many trees. It just adds to your training time and, and adds to your model size, which might be cumbersome. It adds to your predict time because you got to predict make predictions out of all these trees. Um, but you won't you won't overfit. You won't get worse results by having more trees. And typically, 500 to 1,000 is, is typically enough to get to get you know reach that optimal level of performance. Now, in terms of the tree size how deep and how so forth, how, how big to build your tree. In classification, the, the standard is to grow the tree until all of the nodes are pure. So we're actually basically going to grow this out until every single leaf has either all positive cases or all negative cases. And there's, there's a theoretical argument as to why this is best to do. And it's, it kind of has to do with that, that, that any noise that gets introduced by this process will be averaged out across your forest. And so it's kind of like doing these extra splits. If it helps you, great, it helps you. If it doesn't, the worst case, it just introduces noise that gets averaged out. Now for regression, the heuristic, there are heuristics about how, how deep you should build it. One heuristic is to say minimum leaf size of five. Um, again, this is something you could play around with a little bit, but uh, typically the, this heuristic seems to work reasonably well. Now the size of the feature subsets we talked about, you know, if I've got 10 predictors, I'm going to choose a random subset and only, only check those features at each node. So how big should that subset be? Well, you could always just try a range of values and see what does best. Of course, that takes some time. Um, the heuristic that, that came out of the initial paper is that uh, if you've got M features, you could try m over 3 if it's a regression problem and square root of m for classification. Um, and the heuristic usually does pretty well. And if you want to try to do a little better, you can just you know, do, a, do a search. And since it's only across one variable, doing a search is usually not too time consuming. OK, and now we're going to go to the notebook and we're going to show a random forest on a particular example. And we're really, really going to dive into the representation so we can see how the computer represents the random forest uh, in its code. OK, now we're going to get a look at, at random forests and decision trees in action. And we're going to apply them to a, a real data set uh, about housing and house prices in Ames, Iowa. So this is a fairly well-known data set where uh, You've got houses in Ames, Iowa. You have lots of uh, features of those houses. And then you have their sales price. So we're going to just pick a very small subset of these features for demonstration purposes. So we're just going to look at the year the house was built, the greater graded living area, so that's the, um, the square footage, essentially, of the house, the number of bedrooms, and the size of the lot. And so we're going to set up a training data set. And we're going to build a random forest. I'm just going to build 100 trees. I'm going to set the max depth at 2. This is just to make it easier to look at, um, because we're actually going to get into the, the actual nodes of the tree and look at that. And I set the max features to 2. So what that means is that at each, uh, 
at each node, it's going to choose two out of those four variables and only consider those two. So let's let this run. It runs very quickly. And now we've got this RF0 as our random forest regressor object. This is using scikit-learn. And I'm just going to show you real quick how you know you can dive into these objects. So if you if you pick out the estimators, that's a list of the trees. I'm going to pick the very first tree. You pull the dot tree object, and then there are all these different attributes which have all the important things about the decision tree. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you this quickly, just what it looks like in really raw data. So the first two things are the children left and the children right. So the first thing we should say is that there are seven nodes in this tree. So we had max depth of two. So you've got the root. The root splits into two nodes. So there's two at level one. And then there's four nodes at the bottom level, level two. And then we stop because we reached our max depth. So this will have seven nodes, a root, two middle nodes, and four leaves. So these nodes are numbered. Uh, since we're in Python, they're going to be numbered 0 to 6, uh, because that's how Python works, as you probably know. So here we see there's an array for the children left and an array for the children right. So what this means is that 0, the 0th node, which is our root, the its left child is node number one, and its right child is node number four. And so node number one, that's the left child of the root, its children are two and three. And node four, pythonic, its children are five and six. And you see the rest are negative ones, that means that it's a leaf node. So it doesn't have any children. Um, this array gives the, the value at each node. This is just the mean of the y values, so the sales prices of all the houses um, for all the data in that particular node. These are the data set sizes at each particular node. This is what feature was used in the split for each particular node. The negative 2 means that it didn't really use a feature because uh, um, it's a leaf node, so it doesn't actually do a split. And uh, These numbers are the thresholds. So this is like the decision the split value you would use to make a, a thing. And again, you see these numbers are just placeholders for the leaf nodes. So I, I wrote a little loop to make this a little easier to read. We're going to look at uh, a couple of these trees. So this is the first tree. So you can see at the root, we used the year built of the house in this very first tree of the random forest. And the threshold, so the split value found was 1984.5. So that means that houses built in 1984 or earlier went to the left. The left child was child one. And houses that were 1985 or later built go to the right. You see that we had 1,606 data points. So this is the, the, the training sample. So the way this thing subsampled it for the first tree, we had 1,606 data points that it trained on. And the mean value of all the houses in that sample was 181,418. So older houses went to the left child, child one. Newer houses went to the right child, child four. Let's look at node one. So this is what happens to the older houses. So the older houses, first you can see that the older houses do indeed have a lower value on average. Um, there were 975 of them. And then it decided to split on lot area for those older houses. It decided to, to use that variable for the next split and to use a threshold of 12,379.5. So the smaller lot areas went to child 2. The larger lot areas went to child 3. So let's look at 2 and 3. So 2 and 3, we could ignore all this stuff because it's just filler. What we know is that we had 975 data points here. 812 of them went left and had a mean value of 133,000. 163 of them went right, had a mean value of 195,000. And these are the values of the nodes. So these are the values you would use for prediction for this particular tree if, if its decision path went down to that node. Um, now, for the newer houses, they went to child four. 
node 4. And you see at node 4, first you see that there's a much higher mean value. So these newer houses were more valuable. So that's why it found it decided to split on the age of the year built of the house initially. You see it's a pretty big difference between 144,000 for the older houses and 240,000 for the newer houses. And then it decided to split further on the square footage of the house and use a threshold of 1,969. And then it went down to these two nodes. So of the 631 newer houses, 488 of them were on the smaller side, had a mean value of 213,000. And 143 of them were uh, bigger and had a mean value of 328,000. So you can see how this decision tree was built and how it kind of makes sense. And, how these data sets get smaller and smaller as you, you split them. Let's look at a different tree. So this is tree number five. So here you see the first split was done on square footage. So whereas the first tree started out doing old houses versus new houses, this tree starting out on sort of smaller houses versus bigger houses uh, in terms of square footage. So you see it's a slightly different data set. In fact, the way scikit-learn implements this, apparently you even get different sizes, slightly different sizes of data sets. So this one only had 1,589 data points, had a mean of 179,000. And for the smaller houses, it decided to split again on square footage. So you get like really small houses and not so small houses for the two leaves. For the bigger houses, it decided to split on year built at around 1980. So these are the bigger square footage houses. And of those, you've got the uh, the older ones, which were 188,000, and the newer ones, which are 288,000. And so you can imagine, you, you build all these trees, and they're somewhat different, and they have different perspectives and different decision paths. And then you average the results. So you put each, each uh, for making new predictions, you put each one down a tree, you get a, a number at the leaf, and then you average across all these random forests, and you're averaging the different perspectives of these different trees. And that's what makes it such a powerful method. Thanks for watching. I hope you found that useful, and uh, I hope you'll join us for the next video where we're really going to get into forests of gradient boosting trees, or what's just commonly known as gradient boosting, and we'll talk about how we can fit another forest of trees, but in this case, each tree will try to kind of correct the errors of the previous tree, which makes it more powerful from a predictive point of view than the standard random forest. So I hope you'll join me for that. Again, one last time, if you could please like the video and subscribe to the channel, that would really help me out a lot. And I hope to see you watching the next video. Thanks and have a great day.